Greetings, this is World AIDS Day 2013. My name is Dean Beck and you're listening to us on Joy 94.9 or watching us on worldaidsdayworldwide.org. Tonight we're going to see some highlights from what has rolled out throughout Melbourne over the last 24 hours for World AIDS Day. But as is tradition here in Australia, we want to acknowledge the traditional landowners they are the Wurundjeri people of the great Kulin Nation and to their elders, both past and present, and to all Aboriginals who may be watching this broadcast, we pay our respects. World AIDS Day 2014 has seen some huge names come to Melbourne. Amongst them, Aung San Suu Kyi and the head of UN AIDS, Michel Sidibe. I caught up with him right here just last night. So, Michel, Dean Beck from Joy 94.9. Yes. yes. Um, Mr. Sidibe, uh, you're welcome here in Melbourne. Uh, it was very warm today. Uh, you have a uh, busy schedule tomorrow at Government House, but the real uh, trouble starts next July here in Melbourne in, uh, for AIDS 2014. What are you doing to prepare for that? You know, I think uh, already the 1st of December will be a strong signal uh, to the world that uh, coming to Melbourne will not be just uh, a visit uh, to the conference. Melbourne will be a moment to shape the future of the AIDS response. Uh, going into post-2015, Melbourne will be a strong signal that uh, if we want to end AIDS, we need to start uh, ending discrimination, stigma, and we need to really reform the, our policies to be able to go to community, to reach people who are most at risk. And that's why I personally feel that uh, we will all come to Melbourne uh, with the hope that uh, we will have one day uh, zero new infection, zero discrimination, and zero death due to HIV AIDS. Michelle Sidibe, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your time. This is SJ from Joy 94.9 on World AIDS Day. We're at St. Paul's Cathedral where they're about to start an ecumenical service for non-denominational faiths. James Chow is going to be speaking here today. Then we're going to head over to Government House where we're going to hear from On Song Su Chi, Michelle Sibide, the Governor of Victoria and Honourable David Davis, the Health Minister, who's going to officially launch today's proceedings and introduce World AIDS Day 2014, the largest single medical conference that Australia has ever seen. This is SJ for Joy 94.9. Welcome to St. Paul's Cathedral for this ecumenical service on Advent Sunday to mark World AIDS Day. St. Paul's Cathedral is the home church for Anglicans in Victoria, and I'm delighted that members of many other denominations in Victoria are with us this morning. Would you please be seated, and may I invite Mr. James Chow to deliver a word of greeting. It's a great day when we can come together under one roof in God's house at St. Paul's Cathedral in Melbourne, Australia, on World AIDS Day. It shows that after 30 years and millions of tragic deaths, we still care more than ever. It shows that faith community is an essential partner in the AIDS response. And it reminds us again that AIDS has the unique capacity to bring so many different people together in the name of hope and human dignity. I grew up in the church but I have to admit that as a child, getting up for church and getting through the service was always a bit of a struggle. I liked the hymns, I just wasn't so keen on the sermons. Standing up, sitting down and kneeling, it was the most active part of my Sundays. But looking back, it shaped me as a human being and shaped my later work as a UNA's Goodwill Ambassador. I can't remember too many stories from the Bible, but I do remember this one. In Luke chapter 15, verse 4, Jesus says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Well, I ask you, what man and woman are we if we follow the crowd of ninety-nine? secure in the knowledge that we took the safe route instead of doing what we know to be the right thing. 
when I think of that one sheep, I think of sex workers, men who are sex with men, injecting drug users and migrants. We like to say that they're living on the margins of society, but in truth, they have already been kicked off those margins. We sometimes say they are voiceless, but they do have a voice. We're just not listening. Michelle Sidibe of UNAIDS, who's with us today, is leading the world to end AIDS by reminding us that we will never get there if even that one sheep gets left behind. Indeed, that will also be the most challenging last step in achieving an AIDS-free generation with zero discrimination, zero new HIV infections, and zero AIDS-related deaths. AIDS is far more complex than an epidemic. It's a reflection of our humanity. It's a mirror of our views and our response to health, gender, poverty, law enforcement, access to drugs, access to the most basic of services, political leadership, investment frameworks, funding, dignity, sexuality, and the most intimate parts of what lives inside our souls. And when we recognize all of this combined through global solidarity, AIDS has the power to flip a switch in the minds of governments and global communities on issues as politically sensitive as human rights. I've seen it happen. In China, there's been an about face on the HIV epidemic based on evidence. And like for all of us, that's a journey that surely must continue. Today, the world is at a historic moment. Borders have shifted, new countries have emerged. Terrorism, climate change, an economic slowdown that won't go away, conflict and, of course, hunger. But you especially have an opportunity today. Australia has innovated historic breakthroughs in the global AIDS response, and your city, in just a few months from now, will host 15,000 activists from around the world in the name of rights and equality. That's beautiful. A friend of mine once told me that no matter where you go in the world, you will always find two things, a football field and a place of worship. Well, imagine the magic of this, whether you go to a temple, a mosque, a synagogue, or a church, just like St. Paul's, all of us together are the largest volunteer force on earth. So welcome to World AIDS Day, which will be commemorated today in over 190 countries. Yes, it's a great day when we can come together under one roof. Yes, it's a privilege that we are starting the commemorations in Melbourne. And it's a blessing that like the one sheep that got away, we are here with love and kindness for the most vulnerable amongst us. Thank you. Victoria's governor played host to a state reception for the dignitaries here for World AIDS Day 2013. Amongst them was the head of UNAIDS, Michelle Sidibe, and his ambassador, the one and only Aung San Suu Kyi. Here's a little look at what they had to say today. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please for the arrival of His Excellency, the Governor of Victoria, the Honourable Alex Chernoff, accompanied by Mrs Chernoff, Do Aung San Suu Kyi, and the official party. Well, good afternoon everyone and welcome to Government House Melbourne for this very important occasion that marks the 2013 World AIDS Day and links it with the global conference that will be held in Melbourne in July next year, to which reference will be made later. Can I inform visitors from afar, I must confess with some parochial pride, that the intelligence unit of The Economist has for the third year in a row named Melbourne as the most livable city in the world. Today we join to mark an occasion of global significance the annual recognition of AIDS Day since its establishment in 1988 has become one of the most significant health-related occasions on a global scale, involving over 190 countries. The theme 
for this year's World AIDS Day is getting to zero, which reflects the aim of the United Nations and all collaborators of achieving a new, no new HIV infections, abolishing discrimination and cancelling out AIDS-related deaths. Importantly, World AIDS Day is also about public education and a recognition that HIV does not discriminate. The day affords the opportunity to pause and reflect and to facilitate the spread of community tolerance towards those affected by HIV. In July, as I've mentioned, Melbourne will host the 20th International AIDS Conference that is expected to attract 14 to 15,000 registrants from all across the globe. It will bring together medical, science, community, government, representatives and uh, philanthropists who will participate in a truly global and meaningful collaboration on, the on focusing on the provision of evidence-based response to HIV and AIDS that is aimed at zero tolerance. We will shortly hear from a number of world respected speakers in this area. Collectively, their presence here today conveys a strong message of support and encouragement to dealing with the many aspects of HIV and help us, helps us all to focus on the zero vision. Zero does 
discrimination. When we think of discrimination, very often we don't think of what it involves for those who are discriminated against, how it feels to be regarded and to be treated as somebody who is below the normal standards acceptable to the society in which he or she lives. That is what discrimination is all about. You are not treated as an equal in the world in which you live. You are treated, treated as an inferior, as, or even worse, as an undesirable. I do not think there is any human being in this world who is born undesirable or inferior. Its behavior, this is why I say that I cannot accept that HIV AIDS has to do with behavior. Its behavior in the sense of cruelty, in the sense of lack of understanding, in the sense of discriminating against others, that is unacceptable in our world. So what we, whom we have to discriminate against is those who engage in discrimination. This is absolutely unacceptable. We must have our differences and we must recognize them. But these differences should be an opportunity for us to be more complete human beings. When we held this seminar in Burma, in Rangoon, in at our very, very modest headquarters, which could, uh, I think, fit very comfortably into one corner of this ballroom, <laughs> we, we talked about what HIV AIDS was all about. A lot of our audience, it was not a large audience, as I said, it would have fitted into the corner of this room, so, but it was packed, packed with members of our party, suffering from great discrimination at that time, discrimination in the form of political repression. And they were, a, a, the majority of the audience were young people, very interested in this challenging question. What is HIV AIDS? They had not been allowed to discuss it freely uh, in their homes or where they lived, in their street, in their towns. It was a time when people just didn't talk openly about such things. And a lot of people in Burma didn't know what it was anyway. So we were fortunate in having a Dr. Chris Bayer, who is a well-known uh, doctor working for HIV, HIV AIDS victims. He spoke to us about what it was, how we contracted, why we do not need to discriminate against people who have contracted HIV, why we can sit down and talk with them and eat with them and hold hands with them and be friends with them and not be frightened. And then we took questions. And it was amazing how much, how ignorant our young people were, but how much they wanted to fight this ignorance. They wanted to know more. They wanted to know more, not just out of a curiosity of, of, or inquisitiveness, because they accepted that it might well be something that they have to cope with themselves. So it was a very successful seminar. And we, the main thrust of the conclusions we came to after the seminar was the behavior of those who did not have HIV AIDS towards those who did have it. And we decided that two things were necessary. First of all, openness. Openness that we may stop the spread of HIV AIDS. Unless people knew what it was about, how it was contracted, how we could, we could take precautions against it, they would not be able to help in containing the spread of HIV AIDS. So openness was the first requirement. And the second one we decided was compassion with regard to those who had already contracted HIV AIDS. We do not view those who have contracted HIV AIDS as culprits or criminals or undesirables, but as those deserving of our understanding and our compassion. Because we never know when we might one day ourselves require understanding and compassion. But we of the NLD were more aware of this need than most people in our country because we were in need of understanding and compassion practically every day. We were so much discriminated against for our political beliefs that we knew what it was to struggle from day to day.
the members of my party had to struggle, not just to keep their beliefs alive, but to keep themselves free. It was always a possibility that one of us would be taken away in the night. Now, this is not something that only happens in fiction. People are taken away in the night in countries ruled by authoritarian regimes. I've never quite understood it, why it's much more difficult for them to go and make an arrest during the day rather than during the night. Uh, perhaps the point is that they don't like to, uh, they don't like any places which have too much light. And I think in the dark, probably, they felt safer doing what they should not have to do. So, we, with our awareness of the need for understanding and compassion, we were prepared to give. And I, have, I take great pride in saying that uh, the first center for HIV AIDS victims, HIV AIDS patients, opened by a private person in Burma was by one of our young people. She was one of those who we sent to attend a UNDP course on a peer, peer education with regard to HIV AIDS. And she came back from this course, which was just a, a fortnight's course, totally dedicated. And now she is running a very, very well-known center in our country, which is nothing like enough to cope with the challenge of HIV AIDS. But I, we take great pride in this because when we talk about working for those who have contracted HIV AIDS, it's just not words alone. We have shown in action that our party is truly interested in working for those who have contracted HIV AIDS, working for them with openness and with compassion. Uh, the facilities are not good, they're very poor compared with what might be available at state hospitals. But some of our patients who were moved to the state hospitals came back and said that they felt happier because they were treated like valued human beings at our center. They did not have the best care in the world, but they received a lot of compassion, a lot of understanding. So my simple message as the global advocate for zero discrimination is, it all starts in the mind and in the heart. I do make a distinction between the mind and the heart. The mind, of course, is a little bit more calculating. And I think when we look at those who we truly wish to help, then I think the heart must take first place. There must be less calculation and more warmth, more love, more affection more compassion. You never know one day when you will need it yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, His Excellency, the Governor, the Minister Bishop, Minister of Health, my good friend, Aung San Suu Kyi. Today is a very important day for all of us. It is indeed a day to remember, to remember those of 38 million people who died from HIV AIDS. It is a day to celebrate, to celebrate our collective success, celebrate the result of global solidarity, it is also a day to renew our commitment for the future. I would like to start by saying thanks to Melbourne City, thanks to the Governor, thanks for hosting this World AIDS Day in Melbourne. It is not a World AIDS Day for only Australia or Melbourne. It is, we are celebrating here today, the old World AIDS Day of the world. And I want to, to say thank you to my good friend, Aung San Suu Kyi. I'm not surprised that you're here today with us. All your life, you have been uh, fighting 
stigma, prejudice, discrimination. You have been giving all your life to make sure that uh, people without voice will be here. So I am uh, pleased to say that uh, I know only two people in the world, President Nelson Mandela and uh, my good friend Aung San Suu Kyi. We could take this big task of uh, leading us in the road of zero discrimination. And I am so happy that you accepted to take this task because I know that uh, one day we will remember that uh, this World AIDS Day was a historic one. Day where we were all together to say that we don't want anyone to die because uh, he's discriminating, because he's excluded, because he's not having access to life-saving medicine. But today, like I said, is day also to celebrate our success. Because a uh, few years back, people were telling us, just 10 years back, that we could not give a treatment to poor people. That is too expensive. 15,000 uh, dollars per year per person. No way that could be given to African people or poor people in their poor setting. You have been, through your solidarity, able to demonstrate that they were wrong. Today, we have 10 million people on treatment. And the 10 million people who have been uh, continuing to certainly contribute to the transformation of their society. We have been able to reduce the price of a medicine from uh, $15,000 per year to $80 per uh, year per person. That is a huge victory. We were giving 18 pills to people who were sick just a few years back. Today we are giving them one pill a day. 18 pills a day, today one pill a day. is a huge victory. And I want to say that uh, it is the first time we can say that soon we will have a generation free of HIV AIDS. Babies born without AIDS was just part of a dream a few years back. We have been able to reduce the number of new infections amongst children by 50% during the last four or five years. But it's not over. It's not over because when we are all calling for uh, universal uh, health care, universal access, we are facing universal obstacles. We have uh, 71 countries with homophobic laws. We have uh, 41 countries who are denying entry right to person living with HIV AIDS. It is not acceptable that in 21st century will continue to just exclude someone because it's a sexual orientation, because of for who they are, who they love. And unfortunately, we are experiencing that in many places. HIV is growing in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, in Asia, in uh, Eastern uh, Africa and different parts of the world because we are sending people underground. They are hiding themselves. They are scared. And they are discriminated. They are facing prejudice and exclusion. Today, getting to zero is just to remember us that we are uh, starting a new journey. New journey with uh, do and San Suu Kyi to make sure that those uh, punitive laws will be removed, that people will not be considered anymore because of who they are or who they love, but will be just considered as a human being and will all have access to life-saving services. I'm so pleased.
that we are starting this journey in Melbourne. I'm so pleased that you are with us. And I'm so pleased that we'll continue this uh, a journey together. And one day we will remember that uh, this uh, fight against HIV AIDS was not just a fight against a disease. It was a fight for social justice. It was a fight for redistribution of opportunity. It was a fight for making sure that the right of uh, people who are excluded are respected. It was a fight to make sure that violence against women will be stopped everywhere. It will be remembered as the fight for justice. And I want to... to Bill Botel is the Executive Director of the Pacific Friends of the Global Fund. Bill, thank you very much for joining us on World AIDS Day. Hi. Bill, uh, the region itself, the uh, Asia-Pacific region, has its own challenges with regards to HIV and AIDS. What is unique to the area? Well, of course, the Pacific uh, has relatively a few number of people spread out over a sixth of the Earth's surface. So when you think of the small Pacific Island states, small populations uh, spread over many islands and many islands in each country. Uh, in Papua New Guinea, of course, it's a very difficult terrain, uh, bigger population, but still spread out over rural and regional areas that are really difficult to reach uh, for any primary health care service, much less making sure that everybody who needs it has got access to antiretroviral therapies. So small population, widely, dis widely spread out, and in many countries a very rudimentary primary health care service. The Global Fund itself, uh, and I know Papua New Guinea, has had quite a lot of philanthropic uh, donations and corporate donations, and really that's what the Global Fund set up to do, isn't it, to disperse that. Tell us about it. Yes, well, the Global Fund's a tremendous success story. Since it was set up in 2002 by the G8 group of countries, it's raised about $30 billion, mostly from uh, governments, but also from very big philanthropic donors, most notably, of course, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now, that 30 billion, about half has gone to providing HIV treatment uh, in the poorest countries of the world, and some more goes to tuberculosis, which, of course, is uh, a co-problem uh, with a HIV. So it's, it's had new money, uh, together with the American uh, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which has uh, raised about 50 billion, five zero billion, this has made a tremendous difference to the number of people who are on antiretroviral therapy around the world. More people are on therapy, the less infectious each person is, and of course therefore the, uh, the, the new HIV caseload goes down. So we've had 20-30% reduction in new HIV caseload in the world, not in every region, but in the world, uh, in the last 10 years, thanks to this money coming behind the right strategy and all the hundreds of thousands, millions of people in the world who are involved in care and treatment prevention uh, services. You, I know, have uh, said that the world has an AIDS issue, Australia has an HIV issue. Tell us what you mean by the difference in that. Well, of course, 30 years ago when the problem first became obvious in Sydney and Melbourne and Australia, uh, people were becoming infected with HIV, mostly without knowing it. 
then developing uh, AIDS, becoming sick and dying median age of 10 months. So we had a real AIDS problem. We had hundreds of thousands uh, of young people, particularly young gay men, uh, being infected with this uh, disease and then dying. Now when treatments came online in, from 1996, slowly, not all at once, but slowly, everybody who had uh, the problem in Australia had access to treatments. Uh, the rate of deaths from AIDS declined dramatically and then the rates of new HIV infection, of course, fell very considerably. So we have a problem in Australia that is an HIV problem. People are on treatment, they have access, they live long and productive lives generally, uh, and uh, we don't have that problem of deaths from AIDS broadly, although people still are dying, of course, at a, at a small level. Uh, in the rest of the world, uh, Central Asia, still in sub-Saharan Africa, Russia and so on, there's a real AIDS problem. People don't have access to treatment. So they're getting sick and they're dying and they're, uh, you know, their lives are very, uh, uh, very uh, sad and tragic. In the beginning of the epidemic, Australia's response was uh, world leading. Uh, we now see an ever increasing amount of uh, gay men uh, getting uh, HIV and also worldwide uh, the youth component is now about 50% of new infections. Uh, what's going on there? Well the paradox of prevention is a real one. The more you prevent a problem uh, from developing or get rid of the problem as we more or less did in Australia, we don't have an AIDS problem, we have an HIV problem. It's very hard to tell each new generation of 15, 16 year old young people, particularly young gay boys, uh, don't uh, have unprotected sex. Uh, every parent knows the problems of convincing young people that you shouldn't have sex, do drugs, drive fast, uh, go bungee jumping and all the rest of it. So it is a problem. Uh, every, every generation has to be at least given the basic uh, information, the tools, uh, clean needles, syringes, condoms and so on and made sure that they understand the nature of the risks and how they can best prevent themselves being infected and uh, passing on an infection to their, to their partners. It won't work all the time and the new rates are going up in Australia off a very low base and I'm glad that governments, New South Wales, Victoria, other governments are, try are now trying to re refresh and renew their HIV prevention campaigns, reactivate the partnership reach out again to young gay men, people at highest risk of HIV infection, and talk to them again, persuade people, and uh, give them all the tools and information they need to make a rational, informed decision. Uh, you don't want to get HIV, right? Given a, all things being equal, you'd rather not have it. So we, we've got to educate and inform, not just through great things like this, uh, uh, and in venues and clubs and so on, but of course it just has to be a bigger, better uh, return to proper sex education, particularly for young gay boys, young gay men, uh, in schools. So all of this has to come together. Uh, it's uh, a really uh, a, a shocking abdication of responsibility on the part of schools and governments, uh, people who are responsible for these sort of things if they do not educate young people realistically and honestly about HIV infection, Sex matters in relation to sexuality and, uh, and drugs. I know as a, an ambassador for the Enough Stigma campaign myself that stigma plays out in all sorts of ways uh, with regards to uh, how community is affected by HIV. Do you think part of the lack of education is brought about by uh, the stigma that uh, HIV still has? Uh, yes. Uh it's a lot less than it was. Uh, I've been around long enough to know what it was really like when things were going very bad. And one of the things, uh, personally, I've always been astounded by was compared to the 1980s, or from the 1980s when we were facing this problem, you would never have thought that 20 and 30 years later, uh, community attitudes would have changed so much to uh, homosexuality, to gay people. I mean, it really, when you look at support for things like gay marriage, uh, portrayal of gay people in television, movies, uh, uh, the normalisation of it, it really is a tremendous change. And not one that I ever thought would have taken place when we were involved in the very darkest days of this, where there was terrible discrimination, not just amongst gay people, but people who injected drugs, uh, sex workers. And I, I still recall what it was like for people with haemophilia. 
uh, it wasn't just the classically marginalised group. Suddenly people with haemophilia were becoming very, very uh, stigmatised and, uh, and cast out. So it's changed a lot in 30 years. I mean, uh, it's, it's an open point in our sorts of societies if you ever eradicate totally stigma and discrimination. But I, I think in Australia, the governments and the people reflect the will of the people and the attitudes of people. And I think generally people are supportive and have been supportive. Uh, Australian voters and taxpayers, governments of all parties have never stinted in the amount of money they have given for HIV care, treatment, prevention, conducted through AIDS councils and uh, organisations and people like yourself and others who talk to the most at risk populations and of course in research, scientific research. Uh, I think Australia has done as well as anywhere in trying to tackle the underlying problems and I think that still shows up well in our, in our HIV infection rates. Here in Australia and seemingly uh, emergingly more often in uh, the UK and in the USA, we have a co-infection issue with hepatitis C. In this region though, on a broader scale, tuberculosis is the main uh, co-infection. Tell us about the focus of that as we head towards AIDS 2014, the conference here in Melbourne in next July. Yes, well, I think it is very important to understand the uh, slightly lateral and under not well understood uh, threat that TB poses. Uh, it was one of those diseases that I think people just forgot about in, in much of the Western world and in Australia. But if you have 35 million people in the world living with HIV, hopefully one day all with access to treatment, of course they still have a very suppressed immune system. And things like TB, and goodness knows what else, but certainly TB loves that. They ju it just will move in. So the, a very good reason to prevent the spread of HIV, not just to treat it, is to reduce one by one the number of people with HIV and who are therefore not susceptible to TB. Now we know we've got a, an emerging long-term co-infection rate with TB and it is very important that money goes into the science and research around TB. Uh, of course it thrives in places in cities where there's close proximity or poor sanitation or otherwise poor health facilities. So one thing leads to another and uh, TB is a symptom of other sorts of deprivation and, uh, and uh, overcrowding and lack of sanitation and so on. So all of those things have to be tackled as well. Uh, it's no use, well it's very useful to put money behind uh, treating people who are ill but I'd rather go very strongly at the root causes. Lots and that's about infrastructure, really? It's about infrastructure and it's about making decisions. I don't think the world needs one more nuclear powered aircraft carrier. It certainly doesn't need a hundred more jet strike fighters. There are lots of things in the world that we can do without and should never have. And they cost billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, compared to which the cost of the tens of billions to get on top of things like HIV and TB is just a drop in the bucket. And uh, people have to come up against this too. There are things that we should not spend money on in the world. And there are things that we ought to do. And if we spend money on those things, the world will be a lot better, healthier, happier, and more secure place. Uh, so people who think about this have got to think about uh, the way in which we structure the, the spending we do in the world and stop spending on things that are endangering international public health and security. Bill Botel, thank you very much for joining us on World AIDS Day 2013 and for your support of our worldwide broadcast. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Victoria's Health Minister is David Davis and he was one of the speakers at Government House here this afternoon in Melbourne for World AIDS Day. Amongst the speakers was uh, Dawn Ansuchi and also we had Mikhail Sibide. Now, this has been a pretty big event here uh, for Government House and certainly the biggest World AIDS Day event we've had in Melbourne and all in the lead up to AIDS 2014. Um, I'm proud to have been here. I'm very proud to have joined with Aung San Suu Kyi and the Governor and uh, uh, Michelle Sidibe and others in welcoming people but looking to 2014 as well. So there's some very clear messages about discrimination. There's some very clear messages uh, to welcome people to Melbourne 
in July 2014. So I think it's been a, a great day and uh, I must say it's been uh, a very great and open opportunity for people to mix, to talk and to meet each other. Our broadcast today on World AIDS Day Worldwide.org is going global and it is an invitation to people around the world to join us for AIDS 2014 in July. What are you looking forward to most? Well, I'm looking forward to the enormous range of people who will come from all over the world, researchers, activists, community members, uh, clinicians, all coming together in a massive conference with one aim, to look for cures, to look for ways forward, to look for a solution uh, to uh, ensure people have the very best outcome. And the opportunity is there. I think we can learn from each other and Victoria certainly has very much to offer there. We have some wonderful research institutes and, and people who can contribute, but importantly, this is a, a two-way uh, message here and we, we are able to learn from others too. The resounding message from today's uh, launch as we head towards AIDS 2014 was one of uh, stigma and discrimination. That means a connection to community like we've not ever had before to the uh, HIV virus. Uh, how are you going to uh, deliver that uh, through the conference? Because there is a community connection, isn't there? There sure is, and one of the things that distinguishes the uh, um, biannual AIDS conferences is that it's not just researchers and clinicians, it's also community activists and people from all over the world. And we, we welcome that and we see that as a massive opportunity. Victoria has taken some steps in that direction itself with our rapid testing approach, community-based uh, rapid testing, um, but there is many more things that we can do. Here in Australia, we've enjoyed a bipartisan approach to uh, the response to HIV and AIDS. We have a very new federal government, uh, and we were blessed to have the uh, Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, here today. Uh, tell me how the federal government is engaging with this project, AIDS 2014. Well, I was uh, fortunate enough to be talking to the Foreign Minister today and I have no doubt that she will want to strongly engage with this process. Her presence here today is a very firm indication of the importance the government attaches to um, the AIDS conference, uh, but also in, the, in this case our relationship with Burma. And Aung San Suu Kyi being here is a, a very important symbol given her international uh, prominence, but also the, the role she has taken uh, with respect to AIDS. And I welcome that role. I welcome the very strong speech by Michel, Michel Sidove. Um, he, he, I think, made some very powerful points, and I think the audience was uh, very much with him. David Davis, as we wrap it up uh, for our worldwide broadcast, perhaps you'd like to send an invitation to the world. I'd love to say to all across our planet, uh, from where, wherever you come, you are welcome in Melbourne in July 2014. It's a magnificent city. This will be an extraordinary conference and a chance to look forward, uh, to look and reset the agenda, to accelerate the agenda. And uh, we want to see as many people uh, from as diverse a background as possible. So please come. You're welcome. You will find that Victorians, Melburnians, are extremely friendly people. We look forward to welcoming you to AIDS 2014 next July. David Davis, thank you for joining us today. Great pleasure. We hope you've enjoyed these highlights from World AIDS Day 2013 here in Melbourne, Australia. As we head towards the conference in July of next year, we invite you to join AIDS 2014 Stepping Up the Pace, a united effort to see the end of the HIV epidemic. Thanks to my colleagues Sarah Killerley and to our cameraman Wes and Heath for joining us today. We hope you've had a great time with this broadcast on Joy 94.9 and revisit the website worldaidsdayworldwide.org for more information. My name's Dean Beck. Till next time, keep well, take care. Bye for now.